Hello everyone, welcome to Blue Dragon Actual. So today's video is an interesting video on reserve and the impact of modality on reserve as we have seen in the thumbnail. This is also uh, that portion of the webinar that we have covered, practical example. Right now, before we start with the video, there are two psychological points that I wanted to cover. Uh, so when in, in your, when I uh, went for IFRS 17, uh, like when I underst started understanding IFRS 17, there was a seminar conducted by IAI. And it was one of the best seminar that I had, uh, probably the best seminar in actually, right? And uh, in that seminar, there was uh, in, in IFRS, they, they was kind of discussing about IFRS 17, uh, GMM model and VFA model, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And this so, so, so through an Excel example. And that is where I, this idea clicked with me that uh, why can't I do everything in, you know, Excel, right? Now I did that in Excel and there are two people like me and there was another a girl who went with me uh, because that seminar was held in Mumbai. So we went uh, to Mumbai particularly for that seminar. And then when we came back to our office, we gave a presentation uh, on, on that seminar. And in order to give that presentation, I have to replicate what they have done, right? I, I, I only got the PPT, but I have no Excel. So I have to kind of create the Excel, right? And that Excel became the, uh, you know, the pinpoint for me uh, doing several calculations, especially also in trading that Excel, I use those sort of, you know, Excel uh, that how can I proper uh, have a proper risk management or, uh, you know, maybe do some sort of stochastic modeling in trading so that it, it also gives me a proper risk management. It shows me different scenarios, right? So that, that's where I learned this. Now, uh, there are many people at that point of time because IFRS 17 was very new at that point of time. And only I believe that our company was the only company which was uh, rigorously working on IFRS 17. And then uh, there are many people who approached me in LinkedIn saying, uh, can you share some material in IFRS 17? I wanted to understand IFRS 17. And I think if I am not wrong, maybe 100 or 150 people approached me in LinkedIn. And out of those 150 people, there is only one person, only one person who came back uh, with that Excel, right? And asked question and she also prepared her own Excel, right? I told her to prepare uh, her own Excel and I told, gave that presentation. I told her, can you understand this and can you prepare your own Excel? And wherever you get stuck, you can ask that question uh, to me, right? So only one person out of 150 people who approached me, right? Uh, only one person had the, you know, the ability to kind of uh, uh, prepare or, you know, prepare the Excel, right? Same thing goes for this Excel that we are going to like right now I'm going to present. Uh, so we conducted the webinar. The webinar was a huge success, I believe, because many people attended and uh, we also have a community now. So you can join that community. The next webinar will be in after the IFA UK exam and end of April or uh, starting week of May. However, this would be a paid webinar and the topic would be actual software, right? Uh, so there, that will be a two-day webinar of 90 days, 90 minutes each, and uh, we'll be going through GGY axis. Uh, and that would be a very, uh, like, if you are a fresher, you would get to see the real, you know, deal that, that what differentiate between a fresher and an actuary, right? Uh, so that is something that uh, I believe you should be looking forward to, and all the details will be shared in that uh, WhatsApp group. If you are interested... You can uh, join to that WhatsApp group through the link given in the description of this video. However, the point is, uh, even in that webinar, I think around 78, 80 people attended that webinar. Only four people went through the I shared the Excel, PPT, etc. Only four people, as per the poll, uh, kind of completed the Excel. So this shows that we are very interested in one crore package, but we are not interested in the effort that is required to get to the one group of package, right? So the the two points that I two psychological points that I very I believe that is very very important is the first point is you have to understand whatever you study in your actual books, whatever marks you score, and because these days the exams are slightly easier because they are multiple choice, uh, Excel based exams, right? So uh, there are ways you can you know probably clear it easier. Also, there is some bit of more leniency, especially in the lower papers uh, from the institute. And uh, you can compare the passing rate. So that would be, I'm not uh, speaking something out of fresh air. Right? It is just, uh, uh, you know, it's backed by data. So all these things are there. So you have to understand your actual material is insufficient. Uh, if you come into practical work, right, your actual material is insufficient. That's 
is just the starting point and that's that that is also one of the point that highlighted in the webinar that if you want to be a good actuary if you don't want to be paper actually but a proper actuary then you have to go beyond the papers right and this this is the sort of thing that will clear your concept then you will never forget something right this is this is how you should uh, approach uh, you know a particular actual problem and also maybe in life right that is the first uh, psychological point that your book is not enough right especially in any financial certification of whether it is cfa whether it is fra your book is not enough practical life is way different because it is done through a software right so it's 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 very very different right that is first point second point is do you have the ability to take the effort today i'll be going through this excel right but do you have the ability to replicate the excel on your own because i'll be explaining every detail right but instead of asking me the excel sheet can you share your excel sheet and say hey arpan i have done this can you share your excel as well right so you can uh, you know join that whatsapp group message me directly and say yeah, i have done this this is my excel this is my working but somewhere this is not matching so i want to check your excel can you do that but i can tell you uh, maybe 100 150 people will see this video and out of that uh, I, I think two or three would have the ability to you know uh, complete this exercise right and that's the difference between a you know a better actually or best actually that's exactly that's the mindset is the is different that's why psychology is so important uh, because everyone is interested in one code package but the effort only one people or two people will give that effort and those are the people who will get to that package right so without any further delay let's uh, get on with this presentation so this is a case study and this case study is about a uh, endowment product which is non participating uh, and this is a five year regular pay product so there are two types of benefit if the person dies within uh, the term right within the five year term then we are going to pay that person 1 lakh if the person survives the five year term then also we are going to pay uh, one year uh, one, 1 lakh rupees right so this is this product has fixed premium which is 17250 i have created a table so whatever is written here is kind of also replicated here 17250 is the premium right and this is what we have assumed like there would be one death every year this is our expected number right and uh, uh, and since there is one death uh, the starting number of policies would be 100 so there this portfolio would have 100 policies at the start like 100 people have paid 17250 uh, to kind of uh, purchase this product and then every year there will be one death right uh, what is the number of surrender 20 12 10 5 now this presentation will not can be considering the lapse uh, shock or lapse impact of lapse on or uh, reserve right uh, but that might be covered in a you know separate video because otherwise the length of the video would be huge, right? Uh, the surrender outgo will usually the surrender outgo will be an increasing factor like increasing curve, so uh, and it will uh, flow into your maturity value, right? So in this case you can see twenty thousand in the second year, first year there is no surrender outgo, the uh, third year that is forty two thousand, fourth year that is seventy thousand. Obviously in the fifth year it is maturity that is one lakh. So you can see that surrender amount is slowly moving into the uh, maturity amount right acquisition expense because it is called acquisition expense it can be only incurred in the first year right or the you know up before the start of the policy that is 2588 uh, commission is 10 percent of the premium right there as you can see if you have studied cm on very uh, you know logical assumption this is also the rate that is kind of usually that is followed in the market 10 percent in the first uh, year because it's take a lot of effort to kind of bring the policy and then it would be 8%, 5%, 8% in the second year, and then 5%, 5%, 5%. There is no commission clawback or anything because of the same, because in order to keep this example, you know, simplified, right? Uh, these are the expense. So 500 rupees is the renewal expense, and then it is getting uh, inflated by 5%, right? So that's how you can get 525 and 551, right? So this this is your product detail. Now, if you purchase a product or if you are working in a core company where you've seen so something uh, there is something called FNU file and use where this sort of you know details are given and there are a lot lot more terms and conditions. So FNU has to be approved by the insurer to kind of uh, by IRDA uh, for the insurer to kind of launch the product and kind of we are kind of in that time zone right March. This is where most of the insurance companies price their product. And uh, you will, they will send the FNUs or reprice the product, and then they will say send the FNUs. And this is where this is the time when the pricing team would be very very occupied. And then from April, uh, the valuation team would be very very occupied, right? And from after March, the 
the product that would be approved by IRD would come, would, the IRD will take some time, right? So by end of May or June, you'll see a lot of life insurance product advertisement because new products would be in the picture. Unfortunate thing about Indian market, there is there is no such concept as new product. Uh, people copy from each other. But uh, I mean, yeah, we can call those new product only, right? So there are a few assumptions that we have, right? Now that we have understood the product uh, structure or the portfolio structure, so there is 100 identical contact. We have assumed that both all these products are identical, like the distribution channel is not different or something is not different, like the risk uh, risk rating for by underwriting for all these products would be same, right? All contracts are expected to behave identically, once again, same assumption, therefore can be assumed to be in the same group with without the need of additional testing. So yeah, we are kind of saying that they are in the same risk zone, right? The cash flows for each contract is projected using the set of assumptions defined uh, previously. What are the assumptions? The assumptions are this thing, mortality, right? Death, how one people dying, that is our assumption, right? Every year, what are the surrender assumption, 20 people who surrender in the first year, 12 people who surrender in the second year, right? These are the assumptions, expense are assumptions because we have not incurred that, right? So we are ex expecting that this would be the cash flows or this would be the assumption that we are going to pay. Reinsurance is not considered just for simplicity, right? You can also easily consider that, but I don't have not considered that. And no surrender benefit is paid in year one that we have kind of given here, right? Surrender outgo is zero, right? So that's the structure of the product. Now in CM1, how we calculate reserve, right? Using assurance factor and notify factor, but do in, in real life, do we use assurance factor and factor? Absolutely not, right? We use something, something else, which is what we are going to learn today, right? So from this point also, you can understand your books are insufficient, right? You might be, uh, you might have scored 95 in CM1 um, by calculating reserve to assurance factor and annuity factor that is practically useless uh, in, in, in your, uh, you know, practical work, right? Uh, so that would not work. However, the basic concept that you have learned, that would work, right? But you would need more to be a, one second, proper actuary. Otherwise, you will stay a proper actuary. You will have no, uh, you have lack of conceptual clarity. You will, uh, do lottery sort of debugging like if I do this maybe this will work or if I do that maybe that will work that's a lottery mindset right you would not have uh, maybe a concrete three scenarios that you would like to try right and that's what separate someone uh, 10 scenarios available how can you zero down to three scenarios and out of those three scenarios one scenario should give you the uh, reason for something right and as I mentioned actually is the person who know the why of the industry so how are we calculating the reserve right so first of all, uh, ignore this, uh, sorry, not ignore, uh, consider this. So we are assuming that expected equal to actual, uh, whatever is uh, we have expected that same thing is happening uh, in the in the, in the the reality as well, right? Uh, so that is our assumption. And we are calculating reserve at the end of year one, right? So we are right now, we are at end of year one and all the two, three, four, five, these are projected figures based on our assumptions, right? Also notice this end and beginning, uh, the suffix like premium is usually expected to be uh, paid at the start of the month, right? The incidence now premium can also come at the middle of the month, right? Because different companies, uh, different uh, people can play a premium, pay premium at different uh, point of time. But for simplicity, we have assumed that every premium is coming at the start, right? Because the interest uh, the, from, the, from the point you are paying uh, an amount, the interest rate calculation start from that amount. So the incidence is very, very important, right? And this is also, this also goes with the same one, right? That premium is start at the start, right? Now, commission, obviously it is dependent on premium. It is also at the start, right? Here, the number of policies that we have indicated is at the end, right? Why this is 79 in this case? 79 because it started with 100 policies. One person died and 20 person surrendered their policy or lapsed their policy. So one, my 100 minus uh, 21, that is 79, right? And this is indicating the policies at the end of the year, right? So commission at the beginning, acquisition expense has to be at the beginning, right? Because it's acquisition. Other expense, so now this can be debatable where other exp expense can be, expense can be also at the end, expense can be also at the middle. But for my simplicity, I have assumed that expense is at the start, which is 50,000. How we are getting 50,000? This is the renewal expense 500 into 100. Because at the start, there were 100 policies, right? So 100 into 500, that is 50,000. Right. And that's because that's because we have calculated it uh, at the beginning. Otherwise, this would be 79. Had this had been end, right? Death outgo, one second at the end. And since one person is dying, we are paying one lakh, right? In the first year, there is no surrender outgo. And obviously, there cannot be maturity outgo in the first year because it is a five-year product. 
Similarly, let's consider the second year, right? How are you calculating the second year? Number of policies at the end is 66. How are you getting 66? So previous year, it was 79, right? And 79 minus uh, uh, 13, right? That is 66, 1% died, 12% surrendered. So that is 66. Premium, uh, because there is 79 people at the start and 79 into uh, 17,000 to 50, right? That would give you 13, 1, 1, 3, 6, 2, 7, 5, 0, right? Once again, 10% of this would be the commission or 8%, I believe. Yeah, 8% of that uh, premium is the is the commission. Acquisition expense cannot be incurred at year 2, right? Because the name is acquisition expense. Uh, the expense at the beginning, so 79 into uh 79 into 525 right you can see that 79 into 525 if i uh just do maybe a f9 so 79 you can see that right and what it what this would be this is 525 right so you can see that death outgo obviously one people died one lakh surrender outgo uh, uh i mean i think in this case there is surrender outgo and then 20,000 is paid and 12 people died. So 12 into 20, 24,000, right? So that's uh, that's it. And obviously there is no maturity outgo. In this way, it is projected forward, right? So how we are calculating reserve using that prospective formula. Expected present value of benefit plus expected present value of expense minus expected present value of premium. So since this is prospective, it means you look into the future, right? And as I mentioned, we are calculating reserve at the end of year one, right? So at the end of uh, what would happen at the end of year uh, five, there are you know uh, there are forty nine people who are still left, and they would pay the uh, maturity outgo, which is forty nine lakh rupees in this case, right? So what is the net cash outgo minus inflows? If we do the sum product, because uh, if you see this this sign, so premium is positive, right? Uh, commission is negative, acquisition expense is negative, other expense negative, death outgo is negative. So I have indicated that by minus one and I have done the sum product, right? So only premium is positive here. You can see this is the cash flow, right? However, there is a problem in this calculation. The cash flow is not correct. Why? Because as I mentioned, one cash flow is at the start, one cash flow is at the end, right? So if you directly kind of, you know, uh, add and subtract, then you are missing on the interest. So this portion is not correct. I have deliberately put this portion in fact in the in my webinar i asked what is wrong with this calculation right and everyone answered right so they are they were listening to me uh, properly moving on so what so that's why we need to separate the cash flow at the start of the period right at the start of the period so what is the cash flow at the start of the period the cash flows that you have incurred premium is the positive one the remaining would be negative one right so that's what i have done so the cash flows which are the start of the period are calculated separately what are the end of the period cash flows because cash flows which are at the end of the period are denoted by this, right? So cash flows which are at the end of the period are kind of calculated uh, separately, right? And that brings us to present value of future profit, right? Simple, right? It's present value of future profit and present value of future profit is what? Your reserve, right? Your expected present value of so inflow, uh, expected present value of outflow minus expected present value of inflow. That is the formula for uh, prospective reserve. Is it that simple? No, it is not that simple. What is happening here? If you see this, when you are uh, doing the calculation, so I can understand, yeah, yeah, K8, right? So present value of future cash flows, right? Now we are discounting it at the start, right? We are discounting it in this in this calculation, we are discounting at the start. Uh, so instead of calculating the reserve at uh, T at the end of year one, we are calculating in this case, right? Present value of future cash flows. In this case, we are calculating the reserve at the end of, uh, at the start of year one. Right. And we'll also see in the remaining portion, uh, the reserve at the end of year one. Right. Usually by reserve, we mean the reserve, which is at the end of, uh, you know, year one. When we calculate it at the start of year one, that is something else that is called VNB. Right. In any case. Uh, so what we are seeing here is uh, minus of K8. What is minus of K8? Minus of K8 is this uh, figure, uh, which is the start of the pure cash flows. Right. This is an inflow. That's why it is in positive. Right. So that's why because expected present value of inflow is a negative uh, thing in reserve. Right. So that's what we have seen. And since we are calculating at that point of time, so this is not getting discounted because it is beginning of the period. And this end of the period cash flow is indicated by L8. L8 is getting discounted by the discount rate, which we have assumed here to be consistent 8%. Right. The discount rate is considered to be consistent 8%. Now that I can understand, but what is happening? Why this figure, which is the next year figure is also getting discounted, which is this M9, 
why that is happening right what is the reason now you can pause this video at this point of time and you can try to think why this is happening why you are taking a figure of the previous uh, the next year that figure has actually not been calculated right now right so at this point of time the figure is not yet calculated so why are you taking that figure you can pause the video and think for a minute and then uh, you can come back to the answer so the reason is because you are calculating the result by prospective method, right? So in prospective method, we need to uh, project till the end of the five year because we are looking at the future, then discount it back, right? We cannot start the calculation from uh, year one, the reserve calculation, we first have to go to year five, then from year five, we have to, uh, you know, kind of calculate back. Why? Because we are using prospective method, right? In prospective method, we are projecting to the future. So first, we need to project the cash flows. And from there, you can see how cash flows are important in life insurance, right? So what is happening here? We have to come to this zone, right? This, uh, the last figure. So in the last figure, we are seeing uh, the year five figure. The start of the period cash flows is this, right? Start of the period cash flow, which is denoted by K12. And the end of the period, uh, period cash flow, which is denoted by this, it is which is the L12. Now, if you see that L12 is discounted because we are coming to the start of the year five, right? And this cash flow is incident at the start of the year five. This cash flow is at the end of the year five. If this is getting discounted to come at the start of the year five. See, the concept of discounting is also getting used, right? And then you are getting 37638829. So at the start of the, at the end of the year five, these are the cash flows. You are calculating the reserve, right? At the start of the year five. So, uh, this these two cash flows are dis one cash flow is getting discounted to be incident at the same point of time and that's how we calculate the reserve. Now we move to so this is where our reserve calculation starts right. First we project the cash flows, then we come here and then we move to year four right. So your uh, reserve calculation is happening in a backward manner right because you are discounting it back. Now uh, how many cash flows we have? We have this cash flow which is the uh, year the, the cash flows or the reserve that is at the start of the year five right. And that start of the year five cash flow can also be considered at the end of the year four cash flow because what is end of year four is also start of year five, right? So this cash flow is considered as end of year four, right? And also we have this cash flow, which is this four lakh sixty thousand, which is also the you know the end of the year cash flow as kind of written, right? End of year four. So these two cash flows are getting discounted, and this is the reserve, uh, and this is the premium which is at the start of the year four, and obviously with that negative sign and obviously that is uh, you know uh, that is at the start right so we are getting we are discounting it back and in this way similar thing has been followed for year three and this is the you know the end of the year four cash flow or the start of the uh, year uh, this is the end of the year three cash flow right which is written by ld10 and also this represents the end of the year three cash flow right and uh, in this in this way, uh, this is the end of the year three cash flow. Also, this is the start of the year three cash flow. You are discounting it. I, I hope you are getting what it is happening, right? And now we are seeing this is the reserve, right? The reserve is negative of 57,300. I already made a video on can reserve be negative. So if you have any doubt, uh, you can search my YouTube channel, right? You can scroll down on my videos and you can see uh, why if a reserve can be negative and in which situation reserve can be negative obviously you can see that reserve can be negative here right so 57300 is the reserve calculation so i hope this calculation is clear now if you can do this calculation any actual software right that you would be working on if you are a fresher uh, if you have cleared only one or two papers if you are one thing to uh, maybe you have cleared uh, you are struggling for a job right now or if you have got a job but you are struggling in the job, you have no idea what is going on, right? You are pressing few buttons and you believe that that is actually, that is not actually, actually is understanding the concept, right? That is actually, and actually is uh, uh, having reason for everything, right? That is actually, uh, and if you don't have the, if you don't know the reason now, maybe two months down the line, you should know the reason, but your mindset should be that, that I should know why this is happening, right? The answer for that why is very, very important. Now we move to the model D shock, right? So what is the modality shock that we are, so earlier we are assuming that, you know, uh, deaths, there are only one death. Now we are assuming that in the year four, right, there is five deaths, five deaths are happening. So what we have done is we have changed this to uh, five, right? Now there is a reason that I have highlighted this cell year two, right now that reason would not be apparent, but I'll uh, come to that portion. So in the year four, there are more deaths, right? Like, like if there is a modality shock, 
uh, instead of one death, you are expecting five deaths. What is happening to the reserve? Right. If you see the reserve, so it's from negative, from negative of fifty seven thousand three hundred, negative of fifty seven thousand three hundred, it has moved into positive of ten thousand eight seventy three. You can see how huge that movement is. Right. If I just do a you know calculation, uh, this would be this minus of this right and put that in a bracket right so you can see that's uh, uh 119 i think i missed the calculation somewhere there is a calculation in me this should be a negative figure that's why it is is this because this is a negative figure it is creating some challenge you can see there is a 119 percent jump right 119 percent jump can you see that 119 percent jump in the reserve how huge that shock is from just because five people instead of just four more people died right 105 percent shock in the reserve 105 119 percent increase in the reserve right so here you can see if the moderate increases right uh, what would happen to your reserve the reserve increases now this is a very common interview question, right? If you have done it in this manner, you will never forget this because you have seen th this happening, right? You can see every figure is getting changed, right? You can see that death benefit uh, would be, in this case, you can see the death benefit from 1 lakh, 1 lakh, 1 lakh, has increased to 5 lakh, right? So you can see this, right? And you can clearly understand why something is happening, what is the impact of this 5 lakh, right? So obviously you can see that, you know, the reserve is increasing. Now, suppose... I increase the reserve, uh, I increase the death here, right? Five here. So the shock come to the company early, right? So this is these are called early deaths. Now look at the reserve. Instead of 10,000, it has become 1,64, right? And it is 387% increase in the reserve, right? So even a moderate shock in any form is detrimental to the insurer, right? And earlier there was 119% increase. But if that shock come early, right, then it's a even more massively detrimental thing for the life insurance company, right? So this also kind of move us to another concept, how important underwriting is, right? Because underwriting is supposed to catch if someone is uh, like going to die or not, right? And if someone is going to, if some some life is substandard, you need to charge higher premium, right? In In this case, obviously underwriting has not done that job perfectly and because underwriting has failed in that job because of that look at this increase look at uh, consider the amount of dent it will have in the profit of the company right so this is how the reserve is uh, going to calculate now if you have to calculate the end of the year reserve what are you going to do you are going to take this figure right and this figure and this figure you are going to multiply by the discount rate right so if i come here what is the discount rate? The discount rate is this, right? So this plus one, right? So that would be the answer. So this would be the reserve at the, which which usually we have studied in CM1 or CD5, reserve at the end, right? So this is the reserve, right? This is the end of the year reserve or what you normally call reserve. This is something that we usually call BNB because it's the time zero, T zero, right? BNB is only calculated at one point of time, which is T equal to zero. And this is the end of the year reserve. So from this point, you also know what is the difference between BNB and reserve? Nothing. Just BNB that is calculated at a particular point of time. Reserve is calculated at a different point of time, right? Otherwise, the formula is same, right? Three concept got cleared. If you can replicate your, you know, actual concept in Excel, see how important this is. This would make you a good actuary, proper actuary. And otherwise, if you just clear papers, otherwise, if you just score 90 marks in CMN and share a link in that I'm thrilled to do that, that is not something to be thrilled about. This is something to be thrilled about, right? You have seen what happened and you can feel the cash flows moving. You can change anything. You can change the discount rate. You can change the expense, right? And you can see how the reserve is getting impacted and that will never forget it. You never need to remember the concept. You will automatically, it will be part of you. It will be intuitive for you to kind of respond to that question, right? So if you like this video, please hit the like button. Uh, please join that community that we have, the Blue Dragon actual community, right? We have huge plans for that community. 
and if you are especially if you are interested in the webinar something like this happens in actual software like profit or ggy axis exactly this sort of calculation happens right and uh, once you understand this you can understand any actual software right uh, so join that actual community uh, from the link in the description uh, like this video share this with your friends and subscribe to my channel thanks for watching this and see you in future videos